As each new generation of video games passes, our advancements in technology and design bring us a new frontier of graphics. The industry's collective drive for realism has brought us a number of beautifully rendered game worlds. In 2018, Rockstar Games' Red Dead Redemption 2 embodied the spirit of the Wild West, with a hugely detailed world that had something new to discover around every corner. More recently, last year's The Last of Us Part II committed to a gruesome, realistic depiction of the end of days. However, despite the constant quest for realism, some games still intentionally choose to go against the grain and defy realism, instead opting for a more artistic approach to games. Today, we're going to be explaining the evolution of stylized art in video games and how technology, art, and pop culture have influenced the games we now treasure as classics. And speaking of stylized art, if you want to learn how to create stylized art, feel free to check out my Unreal Engine course for beginners and my Substance Painter Stylized Textures course. I'll leave a link in the description for anyone who's interested. So before we really dig into this video, I want to start and lay the scene with a brief history lesson. Prior to 1970, the video game market basically didn't exist, and anything resembling a video game was often housed exclusively in a university's very expensive computer. You know, the ones that took up entire rooms. However, within a few years, the landscape of video games became significantly more accessible to a more general audience. In 1971, electrical engineers Nolan Bushwell and Ted Dabney, who would later go on to found the gaming giant Atari, partnered together to create what would be the first ever mass-produced arcade cabinet, and more importantly, the first commercially available video game. If you were one of the lucky patrons of local bars, you might have caught a glimpse of one of these bright, flashy, space-age looking machines. Just imagine the excitement at seeing one of these back in the 70s. It looks like something the Apollo 11 crew would have brought home from the moon. As the screen read, this game was known as Computer Space. In its own words, the game was a simulated space battle that pits computer-guided saucers against a rocket ship that you control. Computer Space was essentially a derivative of an older game from 1962 named Space War. But Computer Space might be more recognizable as the predecessor to Atari's much more refined Asteroids game. Rather than having full control over the direction and rotation like Asteroids, Computer Space toyed with the idea of physics. The player character would remain in a constant motion state until the rocket's thrust was activated, at which point the ship would advance in whichever direction it was rotated. For the time, this was really innovative stuff, and not a far cry away from how physics in space actually work. The thought alone was exciting enough to sell just over 1,300 units of the machine, deeming it a complete commercial success. But as fate would have it, no matter how exciting the game was, it was just a little too confusing and difficult for the average person. Which is a shame, because Computer Space genuinely seemed ahead of its time with regards to its technical achievements, especially smooth rotations of the rockets. Remember that arcade cabinets like these predated any sort of robust photo editing or CAD software, so the on-screen graphics were drafted by hand and soldered onto the memory board of the game using discrete diodes. So while 3D artists today have an almost unlimited amount of tech at our fingers, Creating any sort of art style back then would look more like a physical DIY project as opposed to how we quietly work away on our computers today. And while computer space had many firsts, I'd also classify it as one of the first examples of stylized graphics in a game. Computer space isn't exactly an artistic masterpiece by any means. Each piece of the game's graphics represented something, and without the advanced technology required to render hyper-realistic images, the designers had to be creative with the few pixels that they had to work with. The player character that you control is denoted by this little rotating cluster of pixels in the general shape of a rocket with small fins, while the enemy is seen as a static oval, resembling an iconic flying saucer UFO. Both ships have distinct silhouettes that liken back to old toys and illustrations of the era, making them immediately more recognizable than a more realistic icon of, say, a space shuttle. Sitting static in the background, the stars themselves provide a convincing backdrop to largely ignore while the player glides across the screen, firing small pixels at opponents to represent projectiles. The ideas themselves are simple but they were designed to fulfill a certain artistic purpose, simulating a space dogfight. 
Even with today's technology, the game's graphics still read as intended with a small amount of imagination from the player. Arcade cabinets like these saw continued popularity, and while many known titles spawned from this area, namely Donkey Kong, Pac-Man, Space Invaders, the list goes on, but as hardware and manufacturing got better, the idea of a home console was beginning to become feasible. Many forgotten manufacturers tried to create their own version of a home console, but ultimately no company came even close to Japan's gaming giant. In 1982, Nintendo would release a groundbreaking new console known in Japan first as the Family Computer, or Famicom for short. After the quick success of the console, Nintendo would send the Famicom overseas, renaming it as the NES, or Nintendo Entertainment System. What set the NES apart was its state-of-the-art 8-bit processor, which allowed significantly more data to be stored and transferred on the system itself. With this revolutionary technology, the NES was capable of displaying up to a whopping 54 colors under certain conditions. Believe it or not, this console was what sparked the flame for the rise of the 8-bit era. During this period, developers had a scarce amount of memory to draw on, and artists had to work within very, very strict limitations. But that didn't stop designers from aspiring to create meaningful visuals. In 1986, Nintendo unveiled Metroid for the NES. It was an action-adventure game that was praised heavily for its impressive graphics, immersive soundtrack, and tight controls. It truly was a highlight amongst the golden era of gaming, with the lasting influence of this game being one half of the subgenre of 2D action games known as Metroidvanias. Ridley Scott's Alien was clearly a huge source of inspiration behind the design of the game. The team behind Metroid found the work of H.R. Geiger, the film's creature designer, to be thematically fitting for the enemies in the game. Even with the limitations of the hardware of the NES, the game manages to include a large variety of enemies, stages, and scenery. Fast forward a bit, from 1988 to 1990, Nintendo and Sega's new consoles, the SNES, also known in Japan as the Super Famicom, and the Sega Genesis, arrived on the market. And with them came numerous graphical advancements, namely the inclusion of a 16-bit processor, which allowed games to have higher quality, more colors, and better sound. And with this, we move forward into the 16-bit era of games. Embracing the full potential of the increased fidelity, Sonic the Hedgehog, released in 1991, was a beautiful example of the growing interest in stylized graphics. Within seconds of booting the game up for the first time, the player is treated to a bold and bright landscape that transitions into the iconic Green Hill Zone. Every aspect of the world is in high contrast to each other. The checkered brown texture of the ground sits below the striped grass blades. The foliage, while clearly made out of pixels, manages to achieve a plainer, almost low-poly look by utilizing the numerous new shades of green to create fake, simple lighting. This fake 3D look is also utilized on the ground to create more small areas of visual interest in the scenery as Sonic speeds by. The entire world is an Escher-esque labyrinth that bears no resemblance to reality whatsoever, yet it was visually appealing enough to separate this title as Sega's iconic masterpiece. However, already on the horizon was a brand new frontier for games. The evolution into three-dimensional graphics was one of the biggest paradigm shifts in gaming history. Despite the epic console wars of the 90s, the reality of graphic superiority and the push into today's standards of art came a lot from PC developers. 3D polygon graphics first appeared in arcades and computers with the release of iRobot by Atari in 1984, before making its way onto consoles in the 1990s. Up until this point, Nintendo had been dominating the console gaming landscape. But in 1994, Sony entered the fray with its groundbreaking console, PlayStation. The PlayStation 1 changed the landscape of how games were made, using an optical disc for the first time on consoles instead of the standard cartridge. This new and improved format allowed developers to fit more data on game discs than on the cartridge. The PS1 was also easier to program for, encouraging third-party developers to make more games for PlayStation than Nintendo could keep up with. With these technological advancements came better textures, more full-motion video cutscenes, and longer games. Without the PlayStation disc format, we may not have had Final Fantasy VII the way we remember it due to the ability to use multiple discs for a game. 
But let's not forget the pioneer of stylized art and the polygonal workflow in games it helped shepherd. The Nintendo 64 was responsible for the most iconic games in history, from The Legend of Zelda, or Ocarina of Time, and Banjo-Kazooie, to Super Mario 64 and Super Smash Bros. The new era of 64-bit processors in the mid-90s changed the face of art in video games forever. Compared to today's standards, the graphics back then seemed trivial, but in that era of games, it was revolutionary. However, there is one thing we need to preface when talking about so-called stylized game art of the late 80s and mid 90s. During this early era of games, stylization was the default style due to the technological constraints of the gaming hardware and software. There are two distinctions that need to be made about the way in which we render graphics. One is called pre-rendered and the other is real-time. For the most part, 3D games use real-time rendered graphics. As a result, with each type of rendering, you will receive different levels of quality. Interactivity requires real-time processing, but static, cinematics, and static backgrounds can be rendered in advance. Back then, the differences were drastic. Compare the pre-rendered background and the character drawn from Ocarina of Time. So at the time, while this was a pioneer of graphics, for us, the difference is very noticeable. As the decades of the golden and silver age of video games passed into history, a new era of computer graphics began to bubble to the surface in the early 2000s. And while realism in games became more and more possible, there was still a strong demand and market for stylized games. The freedom to make any type of 3D art allowed game developers to create new workflows and techniques, bringing about diverse games with unique art styles. Blizzard Entertainment is one such studio known for its unique and pioneering art direction. The studio that gave the people Warcraft, Starcraft, and Diablo are widely known for their use of hand-painted textures. Because of the early limitations in real-time rendering, artists would often paint lighting information, such as shadows, highlights, and depth, onto the vertices of textures themselves to make areas appear lighter or darker. The early 90s pixelated art was born out of necessity. The first Warcraft game, Warcraft, Orcs, and Humans, had many limitations. Artists didn't have many options when it came to shape, language, and color and light, like modern stylized games have. There was no concept art departments. They were literally working with tens of pixels per item, with a little bit of color added to differentiate things. In an interview with US Gamer, senior art director at Blizzard, Samwise Dieter, described the evolution of Warcraft's art and the way it forged the path for Blizzard's trademark stylized art. Sam said, The first game kept it simple, but the second offered Blizzard an existing audience that had bought into the concept, allowing it to expand. While Warcraft's art was rooted in normal European medieval fantasy, Warcraft 2, Tides of Darkness, is when Blizzard started to get creative in terms of art and storytelling. Nowadays, you have a lot of games with a sort of Blizzard art style, but when we made Warcraft, it was pretty unique. People had an idea of fantasy that was dark and sort of heavy. Warcraft had a bit more hyper fantasy to it. Blizzard games were a little brighter, a little more cartoon inspired compared to its counterparts, who drew from Dungeons and Dragons artwork or the famous Frank Frazetta paintings. Warcraft 2 built on the foundation of the first game, introducing players to dwarves, trolls, elves, and goblins. But Warcraft 3, Reign of Chaos, is where the game really came into its own. Never heard before races like Night Elves and Tauren were invented. It was here the lore, character, and cinematics really took shape into what we think of today as Warcraft. Warcraft 3 also marked the transition into 3D polygonal models instead of using 2D sprites. With the blueprint and art style for Warcraft established by this time, and the technological limitations of previous games now lifted, the evolution into the world of Warcraft MMO was made all the more possible. The Warcraft art team was no longer developing from a top-down perspective. Now, they could really push the design and aesthetics further than ever before, creating the unique characteristics of each building and character from a third-person perspective. While the early incarnations of some of these games use hand-painted textures out of necessity, a lot of these games that now emulate the Warcraft style have carried on the tradition of stylized art into their newer games as a part of the Blizzard DNA. Let's fast forward to the modern era of gaming. The modern era of gaming is nothing like we could have fathomed at the inception of the game industry. 
On one hand, realism and stylization have been pushed further than ever before because of the new lack of technological limitations. On the other hand, the clear cut between the two styles isn't so easily identified now. Nowadays, to be truly realistic, you have to use photogrammetry like Call of Duty or Battlefield. Everything else can said to be have a somewhat stylized art direction now. Whether it's the hyper-realism of Naughty Dog's Uncharted with its vibrant use of colors, light and atmosphere, or Blizzard's Overwatch which has slightly stylized textures and slightly exaggerated shapes but is still grounded in realism. With all of this mixture of styles, sh** gets weird, but we wouldn't have it any other way, would we? Nowadays, the computer hardware that makes up consoles and PCs are so powerful that to the untrained eye, maybe to our grandparents for example, some of these games are so hard to tell from real to fake. Counting polygons or triangles isn't as important as it used to be, so models don't have to be restricted to block the shapes and animated sprites. The memory budget is higher too, so pixelated games and low quality textures are an option now, not a requirement. Although while the technology might have improved, that doesn't mean stylization is going to go away. On the contrary, it has morphed into new forms of expression. We now have the ability to make complex shaders which have given us new ways of rendering materials like cell shading or tune shading. Cell shading is a method of generating cartoon style graphics for 3D that looks almost as if they're 2D, much like the style you'd see in your favorite animes. The name cell in cell shading actually refers to the word celluloid. A celluloid is a transparent sheet used in the process of hand-drawn animation. Cell shading will typically have less gradients, less shading color, fewer tints, and will be more simplistic in textures and appearance. A popular game using cell shading is The Legend of Zelda Wind Walker, which has gone on to be a genre-defining art style, which has been emulated in dozens of games now. The future is no doubt looking bright. Game art communities are at an all-time high with no indication of slowing down. While realism is going to be pushed to become indistinguishable from reality very soon one day, with AR and VR becoming more and more powerful. I believe stylized art is here to stay. Sure, there's going to be new ideas for art direction in this category, but the bottom line is stylized art is more rooted in the foundation of traditional art, and the foundations will never change. I'm very, very excited to see where this new frontier of technology takes us. Thanks for watching this video, guys.